Okay, I do this presentation as something like this every year, um, and I try and I keep playing with the format because I'm never 100% happy with what it is, and I don't like duplicating slides a whole lot. Um, but unfortunately, there are some duplicated slides in here. Uh, so the ones that I just shared, I'll skip over, but I wanted to have a self-contained presentation. Um, so let's talk about the toolkit. Um, I'm First thing I'm going to talk about is looking at adoption and usage. So this is something that is always tricky to figure out with open source tools, because um, obviously I, people can just download the code on GitHub and start using it, and I have no idea um, who's doing that or, or where it goes or how they use it. I just know what people tell me. There are a couple of places where we can get some concrete metrics. So one of them is from Conda. Um, so uh, all of the stuff that gets installed from Conda Forge um, or from the RDKit channel, though I'm encouraging people not to use the RDKit channel anymore, but anytime you install the RDKit from Conda Forge, um, there's a, they keep track of the numbers, the download numbers. So these are the download numbers for the three major operating systems, so 64-bit Linux, 64-bit Windows, and 64-bit OS X for the last 12 months. Um, and so these are shown all on the same scale. You can see that Linux is a lot more than Windows or OS X. This shows each of them on an individual scale, so you can see the actual evolution over time. Um, and one comment about these numbers, um, I don't really believe these numbers for a second, right? There are not actually 100,000 people that are installing the RDKit kit every month. Um, I just, I, don't believe that. I think most of this, particularly on the Linux side, most of this is happening inside of auto, inside of automated build pipelines. So that, that's why the Linux numbers are so much higher than the Windows or Mac numbers. But um, still, there's a lot of people using it, and usage does have a tendency to at least somewhat go up over time. These are the others. And Conda makes builds available for, for things other than the three build platforms. Um, Conda Forge does other than the three major platforms. So those, these are those other platforms. 32-bit um, Linux and Windows, which, thanks good, which thank goodness not very many people are using. Um, and then uh, PowerPC Linux, this I think is the ARM architecture. And then these are the new Macs. Um, you can see this, the already kept builds for the new Macs became available in March. And you can see that the adoption there immediately started to shoot up. So I think this feels to me like something more closer to actual real usage numbers. Like it's, I'm more willing to believe a couple of hundred users really installing it per month. That these are probably real numbers and not just CI pipelines. Anyway, um, what about Python version? Um, so we can see here, basically, this is the evolution, I think, of the various Python adoption, of the adoption of the various Python versions. So 3.6 used to be the major one and that fell off pretty sharply at the beginning of 2020. 3.7 came up to replace it and 3.8 is continuing to grow and 3.9 is starting to grow. And um, there is not a build available for 3.10 yet, I don't think. Um, and there certainly wouldn't have been any long-term statistics for it. So that's not here, I'll, I'll show that next time. But you can see people are using multiple Python versions, all of the Python versions. Um, um, and it's been a really long time since I had a picture, so I need to include this just to allow me to have a picture. Something new that happened this year is the already get JavaScript builds are now available through NPM. Um, and that's due to some work, a lot of work actually that Michelle Moreau did. Um, so this is all set up. He set up an automated build pipeline so that when we do already get releases, they land in NPM. Um, so this is really cool. So for people using the RDKit JavaScript wrappers, which I will say a very small amount about, and then Polo will say more about that um, tomorrow. Um, but for people using it, uh, you can now install those directly using um, NPM. And you can see there's about 400 weekly downloads. So these are being used. Again, I think these are probably mostly build pipelines, but we'll see. Other adoption measures. Um, we saw these already. This is from the, these stats um, in the previous one. There's no new numbers there. These are the issue trackers. We saw that. Community, we saw already. 
um, just the list of open source projects. This is the same list. These are the four that came on this year. So the way things land on this list is there's this is in GitHub actually. So people submit pull requests, and then I update that updates something that's in GitHub. It's in the RDK docs, and I update this slide. So if you're using the RDK in an open source project and it's not on this list, um, do a PR and get on it. It'll end up on the list. Okay. Um, just quickly, the most frequent code contributors in the last year were the four maintainers, which makes sense, right? We're the ones who end up actually doing the merging the pull requests. So we get the credit, if you like, for the commits. But the thing that I'm really happy about is in the last year, there have been 44 different people who have had a pull request merged. So this may be um, something like a uh, new feature, maybe a bit of Python, maybe a documentation update. Um, it could be any of a number of things, but these are all people who've had code merged in the RDK in the last year. And this is what I really want to see, right? I want to see the community growing. I want to see people contributing in all the different ways that people can contribute. I think this is really cool. We started tracking maintenance work. This is, apologize for people who just want new features. Um, I think it's important to uh, make sure that the code continues to be maintainable and that we do clean up. Um, so the code is pretty old, right? It was the, it was 20, it's about 21 years old now, 20, 21 years old, depending on which piece of the code you look at. The old, those are the older pieces. Um, my understanding of the programming language has changed, the programming language has, has changed um, and yeah, and there's just been a lot that's changed in the last two decades. So code needs to be cleaned up and we're doing work to do this. Um, we started tagging the maintenance and cleanup work so that we can track this. And these are the number of, these are the pull requests or the number of pull requests that are connected to cleanup that has happened in the last, um, in the last year. Again, this is really a health of the project thing. It's not in user visible, but it, it, it's, I think it's really important for long-term sustainability and maintainability of the RDK. Um, one of the things about the roadmap and the changes that we want to make is, and the old, this, or the, we can say how ancient the RDK is. Um, there are some changes that we would be nice to make in the code. For example, taking advantage of new language features um, or fixing broken APIs, things like this, that it would be really nice from a software development perspective to do. But that's hard because we don't know what people are using in the code. Um, we don't know which operating systems or compilers people are using, so we don't know which compilers we can switch to, which new language features we can use. Um, there are some larger API changes that I would really like to make in order to clean up some of the old mistakes that were made um, that would make it easier to write new code, both on the Python and on the C++ side, and it would remove some of the frequently asked questions about the RDK. Um, but we can't just do that, because if we just do it, it's going to break a bunch of people's code. And that's something I'm not willing to do. Uh, so the thing I really, really want to avoid is what happened in the Python community when they went from Python 2 to Python 3, where there were two versions of the language that were not really 100% compatible with each other that had to coexist for more than a decade um, before they finally essentially killed Python 2. I really don't want that to happen in the RDCAT. So we've been having in the maintainers community, we've been having some discussions about ways that we can figure out ways that we can do some of these larger scale changes we want to do in a way that makes them optional to people that are using the code. So you can have your old code continue to work but can still use the new one in newer projects if you want to. And I think we'll be able to start to see some progress on that in the next year, hopefully. Some of the things we're doing to solve, to deal with some of these problems and prevent them from getting worse, um, we're trying to minimize hard external dependencies. Um, so we have a boost dependency um, that makes some people angry or irritated uh, for reasons I don't completely understand. Um, but otherwise, we don't have a lot of external dependencies in the RDK. Most of them are optional. Um, so for example, using the CoreGen program from Schrodinger 
to get much better coordinates and 2D drawings, right? That's there and it's optional. Um, we try and avoid mandatory external dependencies. We try and be very conservative about language versions and features. Uh, we do occasionally remove old code and that gets announced at least one major already kept released in advance. It's always in the release notes up at the top for deprecating code. Um, we have a document now that tracks backwards incompatible changes that are made from one version to the next. And then for people who have commercial support through T5, um, I do a version compatibility report with each release that kind of keeps track of um, changes in the output of the code from one version to the next. So for example, if canonical, any of the smiles change or fingerprints change and the like. Um, these are easy for you to do yourself, but for the support customers, it's just something to report I do and send them each time. So that's the high level overview. Um, what I'm going to do now is switch to a notebook to show um, some of the new features that have been added over the next year, or over the last year. Um, so I'm going to be in Jupyter live demoing this with all of the risks that entails. If you want to follow along um, an experiment that I did last year that I'm repeating this year because it worked pretty well. The notebook is already in GitHub, and I set things up so that you can use it with Binder. So if you go to this URL or click on the link, which is in the um, which is in this channel in Discord, um, you will, after a minute or two, will get a browser window open where you can open the same Jupyter notebook that I'm looking at. I and mean, it's not exactly the same notebook; it's the same content, but it won't be the same live notebook. So if you want to try that, give it a try. Um, the, this is using the new beta. So there's a beta of the upcoming RDKit release that is currently out. You can install that on Linux, um, Linux with Python 3.6, 3.7, or 3.8 um, by doing conda install from the RDKit beta channel, um, the RDKit package. And that's what's being used in this binder notebook. So let me go to the notebook. And let me make the font a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. Um, I'm not going to review the um, bit about the incompatible changes. Um, those are in there. You can take a look at it and read it yourself. Um, there's not that much in the new, the upcoming release. Uh, on the front of the, the JavaScript wrappers, so in a couple of releases ago, we started doing what I called minimal lib, which is a minimal subset of the RD kit that exposes some important functionality um, and have made that available as a, um, in JavaScript wrappers. That is what I mentioned already. That's what's packaged on NPM. Um, and there is, as of I think it was the last release that we added this, there's now a getting started with the RD kit JS that is analogous, same idea as the getting started with the RDKit in Python. Um, and that is a page that you can go to. So you can just go to it directly. It's linked from the um, NPM page. You can go and it'll pull this page up and you'll have a live browser window running. Um, actually, we can just do this. So um, you get a live browser window running with the documentation. So I want to go to the getting started document. So this is the JavaScript wrapper. So this is running in my browser. There's no server involved. Um, the way this is set up is there's sample JavaScript code. And if you click run, it runs it and something shows up on the right hand side. So here's trying molecules in SVG. Here's doing the same thing with the HTML5 canvas. This shows how to highlight. And there's a number of things in here that you can do. Um, if people have suggestions for ways to improve this, this document is in the RDKit's GitHub repo. Um, so if you want to, I did this and I, my HTML skills are abysmal. So if you have ideas for how to clean this up or make it look better or even better, more content for it, please, please, please go to the R. Um, so that was new stuff. Uh, the RDKit contrib folder, for people who don't know it, each RDKit release has a contrib folder. Um, this has a bunch of things in it that people have contributed over the course of the years. Um, this tends to be material um, that was in supplementary material from publications, but there's occasionally just small, interesting projects 
that the author didn't think was worth doing its own GitHub repo for, and it's not really necessarily a great fit for the ArtiKit core. So we just put it in the contrib to make it easy for people to find. So what we have this time, uh, the new ones this time are the Niver structure filters. So these are the, it's a Python script and the smarts patterns for a set of structure filters that the Novartis team published um, last year. So that's the code and the substructure filters from that paper. This um, was something that Nadine contributed. I would like at some point, ideally in the next release or two, we'll get those smarts patterns into the Articats built in um, substructure filtering code, but it just didn't happen for this release. Calculate RMSD is something that Carmen Esposito, who was in Serena's group at the ATA, um, this is something that she did. Uh, and it is a Python script and a Jupyter notebook showing how to use the Python script that has a bunch of different flexible options or a bunch of, it's a very flexible set of tools for doing RMS alignment of molecules and proteins. Um, so if that's something you do, it's worth taking a look at that. There's some really useful tools in there. And then Free Wilson is something that Brian contributed this year, or for this release rather. Um, and it's a uh, Python scripts for doing Free Wilson analysis that includes enumeration and scoring of new compounds. Um, so it does the, the R group decomposition, um, does the scoring of the individual R groups, and then uh, will enumerate new molecules and give you the, the predicted scores. Um, so that's in the upcoming release. Okay. Now let's talk about new features in the toolkit itself and the various pieces. Um, for one of the things you can do with Minimal Lab, uh, that the, up until this point, that's really just been available from JavaScript. Um, in the upcoming release, uh, that's also exposed via the C foreign function interface. People don't need to worry about that. Uh, for people who know what this is, um, if you're using the RD kit from other languages, other programming languages like Rust or Julia or um, any of the other new shiny languages. This allows you to use the RDK from that as long as you use the CFFI interface in those languages. Um, I did a blog post on this earlier this year that explains how to use it. Um, and this, uh, the online version, the online builds of this will be updated with the upcoming release. There are some improvements to the cartridge. Um, most of this is really kind of focused on getting it a little bit more production-y. Um, so like the big one is that now there's an update script. So Postgres allows you to provide scripts which allow you to update your installations of extensions. The RD kit has never had that before. So you, if you wanted to install a new version, you've always had to uninstall the RD kit stuff and reinstall. Now you can do an update and that then basically gives you the new binary and just makes all of the new functions available. Um, and then there's a list of other functions that are available there. I'm not going to go through those in detail. Let's, I want to go through the Jupyter stuff because that's the live demo. And it's, as we saw, 95% of, of you are using um, the already get from Python. So I'll do this as a live demo with all the risks that that entails. Um, start by doing some import. You can see I'm using the new beta. Um, for people who don't know this, when you import the already get, there is this version, this Dunder version Dunder thing that's available so you can see which version you're using. I always try to have this at the top of my notebooks so I can see which RDK version the um, notebook was generated with. It's really nice. For the upcoming release, there have been some improvements to the RDK's integration with Jupyter. Um, so the first of those is mole bundles are now Jupyter aware. So if you create a mole bundle um, and then have that as the last line on the Jupyter cell, you can now see the molecules there in the bundle. Um, it used to be that you would have to do moles to grid image in order to see those. So this is just a convenience function to make it easier. The other thing that's different that um, most of you probably will notice is by default now, if a molecule has properties associated with it, um, they are displayed with the molecule in a notebook. So for example, here I construct the rivalry range from smiles. I set a couple of properties on it. And now if I end the um, if I end the cell with the molecule, in addition to showing me the molecule, it also shows me a table that has the molecule's properties. Um, I think that this is really useful. As I'll show you, you can turn this off if you don't like it, but I think it's really useful. Um, the other thing you'll notice is if the molecule has an underscore name property set, it will use that as a legend in the image. Um, 
There are times when this may be overwhelming. So Paolo pointed out to me during the review of the new feature that molecules that come from PubChem have a lot of features. So this cell demonstrates pulling a molecule from the PubChem REST services. You can see that those molecules have a ton of um, properties set on them. And what happens by default is it will show you the first 10 properties. And then there's a message down at the bottom that says that the property list has been truncated. Um, you can change the maximum properties um, so that it shows you all of them. So here I just show, if I set the maximum number of properties to minus one, then I see all of the properties for the molecule. Um, this is probably not super useful, but it's available if you, if you want to do that. And then finally, if you really don't like this, if you don't ever want to see it, um, you can just add to the top of each of your notebooks, just set the um, hypothensio properties to false, and then it just shows you the molecules the way they used to show it. Um, we continue to make improvements to the drawing code. This is a ongoing thing and probably will never end. Um, it's the joy of doing molecular rendering. Um, it's getting a lot better, but there's only still things that we can do to improve it. Right? Now, if I compare what we have now compared to what we had three years ago, it's just an amazing difference, but I still, every time I look at one of these, I see things that should be done better. Um, so it's one of those, it looks good, but you'll always only see the problems. Um, so this is the molecule I'm gonna be using. Uh, the notebook has a little interactive widget that allows you to explore some of the new properties that are there. Um, so the, there's some tick click boxes so you can see you can add atom indices to the molecule drawing. Um, you can add bond indices, sorry, that was too quick. You can add bond indices. Um, you can add stereo annotations. So this molecule has uh, an enhanced uh, stereo. So you can see the AND group is indicated. Um, the chiral center, which is S, is labeled with the appropriate SIP label. And then the double bond is labeled with the appropriate SIP label. Um, this is just some of the options. Uh, explicit methyl makes it so that these terminal methyls show up as stage three. Sometimes if you have a dummy atom, you want it to be an indicated like an attachment point. So you can turn that on. If you do this, all dummy atoms are drawn with the little squiggly line showing that it's an attachment. Uh, if you want to do something black and white, like for publication, um, you can go to black and white mode. And then one I really like, but I know some folks don't, I really like comic mode. So if you indicate and turn on comic mode, you can see the lines are all a little bit squiggly, like they were drawn by hand. Um, and it switches to using a comic sans like font. Um, I actually, I know this makes Marcus really nervous, but I, I actually use this as my default in the notebook. I really like these hand drawn looking lines. <laughs> And the font I also actually think is incredibly clear. People have bad associations with these comic-like fonts, but the font is really clear and readable. Um, so I actually find this pretty good. Uh, anyway, it's there. Some of the improvements to the rendering itself. Um, the upcoming release has improved rendering of some query features. Um, sorry, I think this was most of this was in the last release. Uh, specifically, this this one query molecule shows most of them. So atom lists are now properly rendered. So you get atom lists shown as atom lists and not atom lists shown as not atom lists. Um, various double bond queries or various bond queries that come out of mole blocks are properly rendered. So this is a single or double bond. This is a single or aromatic bond. This is a double or aromatic bond. And this is an any bond. Um, this, the two circles on the bond indicates that it's a chain bond, and then the six number ring on the bond indicates that it's a ring bond. So these are the conventions we're using to indicate some of those features. I will continue to add um, improvements, or we will continue to add improvements to this, particularly around the rendering of um, atom query features in upcoming releases, but it, this I think is already working pretty well. We can render additional information from V3000 bull blocks now. So for example, if there are data fields, those data fields are now rendered. So this particular molecule has a data field where the field name is PKA and the data is 4.2, and it shows you 4.2. Um, it's rendered where the input tells it to, to put it. Um, polymer brackets are now rendered correctly. Um, so here's an example of a, a 
polymer. Um, and it does show you whatever the label at the bottom is. And then if it's head tail or head to head. Um, position variation bonds are rendered correctly. So this methoxy group can be attached to any of those three atoms. Um, link nodes can be rendered properly. Uh, so this, in this particular case, um, this molecule has between one and four of these carbons with an OH in the ring. And th those are the new mole features. Um, the other thing that came in the release a year ago that I just want to mention, because I think it's really useful and I'm not sure how many people are aware of this. Um, if you create a PNG from the RD kit, whether it's in a notebook or just using the mold control 2D Cairo, um, by default, that PNG includes information about the chemical structure in it. So it's not just the drawing, it also has metadata added, um, including the smiles and mold block for that molecule that allow the molecule to be reconstructed from the PNG file. So you can use these PNGs as molecule interchange. Um, so here's an example I generate just the PNG text for this molecule. And then using mole from PNG string, I turn that back into the molecule. Now there is no AI involved in this. This is just using metadata that is embedded into the PNG string that the RDK creates. This you can also do if you add multiple molecules. So if I use um, draw multiple molecules to, to a grid, um, the metadata about all of those molecules is present in that PNG string. So there's a new function, moles from PNG string, it pulls that out. Um, it works for reactions, uh, and there's additional data in there to store and retrieve additional metadata. Um, I'm going to stop here. The rest of the notebook you have, um, I sent you the binder link. The rest of it is in um, GitHub, so you can take a look at it. I have a couple of minutes for questions, so I'm going to quickly look in um, Discord and pull a couple questions out and answer them now. Um, and then we'll move on to the next presentation. So one of them, uh, so Jennifer asked if the properties display works with mole bundles, um, and it does not do that yet. So the properties um, doesn't work with either mole bundles or with the moles to grid image, um, which would be really useful. Like if you have a, a set of molecules that has properties to lay those out. Um, I have some ideas about how to do that, but it's a little bit tricky. Um, so hopefully for the next release, we can do something like that. Um, let's see, I'll do one more. Um, uh, okay, so Marcus asked if I mentioned me because I know he doesn't like Comic Sans, and yes, I do. I did mention him because I know he doesn't like Comic Sans. He always comments anytime I show a comic mode plot in Twitter. And yes, I know that Noel is the person who doesn't like Boost. Um, there's some suggestions as well for improving the drawing code. And it looks like that's all the questions. Um, there's some suggestions I'll follow up on. So, uh, and there's a question about the link for the RDK community page. I will put that link in the um, in the channel, the Discord channel. So we have two more minutes. I'll just show one more thing in here. Um, so this is Molezip. Uh, this is something that Brian added for the um, last release. Uh, this is a really useful tool together with R-group decomposition. Um, and you can use it with other things, but it's super useful with R-group decomposition. So here's an example. I read a set of molecules in from a JMED Chem paper. Um, this is the scaffold for those. Here are some of the molecules. I run R-group decomposition on those. Um, and this is the output of the R-group decomposition. I have the cores for each one as well as the individual R-groups. Um, and now in the code here, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but the beginning of the code um, uses some Python, built-in Python magic to enumerate all possible combinations of side chains. This is the new code, molezip. So molezip takes a core and the side chains that should be attached to it as two separate molecules, and it gives you back a molecule that has those attached to each other. So it zips them back together. Um, and then this is the output of that. So I started with about 30 molecules. I enumerated all possible combinations of R groups based upon what was in the paper. I removed the ones, there, so there were 260 of those, and I removed the ones that were actually in the paper. These are the 233 remaining. Um, and these are the first six of the 233 remaining, but that's how you would get them with Molza. This is really nice. It's great in combination with the R group decomposition to get new compounds. 
And with that, I am going to stop.